Future trading involves risk and is not suitable for all investors. Content provided in this segment is meant for educational purposes and is not a solicitation to buy or sell commodities. Hello and welcome to Pasture to Pin. We are on episode two of a new series from the Everag Insights team. Each week we bring you market news and updates on the cattle industry with the intention of helping cattle producers manage their risk. I am your host, Michael Todd Rowan, coming to you live from the Texas Panhandle and joined, as always, by my co-host, Trey Freeman. Before we get started with today's episode, we will do a timestamp. Today is Tuesday, March 28th, 9.15 a.m. I hope everyone's spring has gotten off to a good start, although I know our friends up north, uh, particularly in the Dakotas, Montana, Wyoming, are seeing persistent snow and some places seem to be buried under some snow. Not the same down here. Texas, Oklahoma is still rather dry, but pasture conditions are improving in the eastern part of cattle country, if you will. There's been some timely rains the last couple of weeks. But again, our friends up north seem to still be buried under winter tech weather, even though we have seasonally transitioned to spring. Sticking with our usual rhythm, Trey is going to give us a futures market update. Mr. Freeman, feel free to take it away. Yeah, starting off the week yesterday, we saw a gap higher in June and August fat cattle. There's no looking back with fats and feeders closing sharply higher on the day. This is after a somewhat disappointing week last week as pressure spilled over into commodities from the Fed moving forward with another rate hike. Uh, Some disappointing cash may have weighed on futures as well as Fed cattle moved lower, uh, about a dollar lower overall. We did see some one to three higher trade in the north, but the majority seemed to move at about a dollar compared to uh, the week before. Futures, there were a couple spikes lower midweek as they continue to find buying support on pullbacks. And eventually an outside day was posted in fed cattle on Friday with the market closing higher on the week. Overall, the strength yesterday was was a great technical performance and I look for follow through buying today. However, the shock lower in, in financial markets a couple weeks ago, uh, they were a good reminder that caution is warranted. Uh, we know the fundamentals, but as we witness spillover selling from outside markets can uh, certainly bring volatility. Definitely, definitely. Thank you, Trey. As we can see, Overall, in general, these feeder cattle prices, calves are just very expensive. It it just makes you think as we move them to the feed yards and then they move on to to slaughter and harvest what those prices can do. But you also bring up an excellent point. You know, cattle fundamentals, we we have short supply. We, we, We talk about this over and over and over again, but there's also things that we don't we don't know about. And the biggest the biggest question mark when you look at basic economics is is always demand. But again, we don't know what we don't know, which which what is beef demand going to do and what does our grain economy look like? Uh, Touching real quickly on on the demand side, we have decent strength in the cutout, although I will say last week, right after our episode ended, we saw choppiness in the choice side of the choice select spread. It did end last week above the five-day simple moving average, but we did see spikes lower. We saw spikes higher. So trade to your point on volatility, we run the potential of not just seeing volatility in the futures prices. Things tend to smooth out with the cash prices, but we're also seeing choppiness in the choice select spread, thus being the cutout. Uh, The choice side seems to be the choppiest. Uh, Retailers now have very strong margins on the select side of that spread. That spread has narrowed. Grocery stores can get, retailers in general can get fancy with in-store brand naming, such as Blue Ribbon Roast, John's Best Steak. That doesn't have any indication of the actual grade, more of just how that select cut is being marketed. Uh, their blends with ground beef can also can also get a little fancy. Uh, they can blend select beef in with different fat lean ratios. Then you move, you know, you move outside of retail, and that's more a domestic conversation. As we look towards exports, exports have been a little lackluster in 2023. In the last year, they were very strong. China led the way. Our usual trade partners, Japan, Mexico, South Korea 
seen some backing off as far as the exports to those countries. However, exports are up week over week, which is a good sign. However, year over year, we have seen a 32% drop. Now, that's a bigger conversation, but that is that is the year over year measurement. However, back to the beginning of, of, of this piece of the segment, the domestic market has helped lift up the demand side of that equation. Trey, what are you seeing as far as the demand side? Yeah, it's uh, it's hard to gauge demand, uh, especially when Americans are carrying some serious credit card debt and uh, saving savings rates are down. However, seasonally boxed beef it tends to trend higher. Uh, some holidays just right around the corner, and summer buying's approaching. And you know, I'd, I'd expect wholesale and retail buyers to stay in the market. I expect them to dollar average all their purchases here for the next uh, seven to eight weeks. Uh, they have good margins, so. Uh, Why not? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you, Trey. And it's it's easy to be all doom and gloom when you talk about the demand side, but sometimes you don't know where demand is until it climbs a mountain or falls off the cliff. Uh, So that, that will cover it for the demand side. And this is a wonderful time to introduce our guest speaker, Miss Shelby Myers, who is Everag's Grain Market Intelligence Director to talk with us about the grain markets and grain economy. Shelby, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you both for having me. It's so exciting to be here and uh, I'm honored to be your guest for just your second show. So hopefully you'll have me back on uh, in the future and uh, excited to talk grains with a bunch of cattle people. Um, Hopefully I I do you justice. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. Well, I think I'm going to continue on with the demand discussion because there's so many similarities in the grain markets that we're seeing in cattle markets, too. I think particularly that demand question from China. You know, this is the first year that we don't have the mandatory purchases from the China-U.S. phase one agreement for, you know, China to have committed trades from the U.S. in agricultural purchases. And all across the board, U.S. agriculture benefited immensely from that agreement. So this is the first year that we're really testing the real market practices and and kind of market fundamentals when it comes to China purchases of U.S. agricultural products. And that could not be more obvious than in the corn markets particularly. Had you had asked me on the show, you know, a week and a half ago, I would have said the same thing you both did about the demand side of the equation for grain markets on corn side. We lack luster in in exports, but over the last week and a half, we've seen China make major corn purchases nearly every single day that they've had the opportunity, likely hedging bets on what Brazil's corn crop, where it's going to end up next, most likely into Argentina, where they're having uh, a devastating drought and will need some of the corn crop from their, their close by neighbor. So we could see China hedging a little bit of taking advantage of corn purchases from the U.S. to to mitigate their needs. But we're also seeing that their hog herd is up higher than anticipated. And so needing those grains in to supply their livestock sector with the feed needs is another area where we're seeing uh, corn really have an opportunity to take off in the grain markets. And so that's something that we're really keeping an eye on as we head into later this week. We do have the prospective plantings report that'll be released on Friday and Right now, U.S. is on track, uh, according to USDA back in February, to plant 91 million acres of corn and 87 and a half million acres of soybeans. Um, And what that means, I think, for all the cattle producers is that you've got to keep an eye on not only what corn prices are going to do in reaction to that report, but what some of your substitutes are going to do too, wheat and soybeans in particular. Because if we start seeing corn prices fluctuate a little crazy, say, uh, we plant more corn than than USDA thought. You know, farmers. This is a survey based report. Farmers say, "Hey, we're actually going to plant more than 91 million acres because prices for fertilizer, for example, are lower." And you know, we want to take advantage of the opportunity to use to plant corn, use fertilizer at a lower cost, uh, and take advantage of those bigger yields and get those returns. Then we could see you know, corn prices kind of react in in anticipation of farmers actually planting that throughout the spring. This report really is just a mile marker of what everybody intends to plant for the 2023 crop year. Uh, We won't get the final report until the end of June, 
But certainly for cattle producers, this could mean a lot of variation and fluctuation throughout grain markets in the next couple of weeks. Sure. Thank you very much, Shelby. So this just sticks with the theme of we we only know what we know and we don't know what we don't know. So there, the demand side is, is always a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for queuing us in on the demand side of, of the grain economy. And that will wrap up episode two of Pasture to Pen. Thank you again, Shelby. Thank you to my co-host, Trey. Thank you to the Everag Insights team. And as always, thank you to the awesome Paige and the awesome Corey for making this show happen. If you haven't already, please click that subscribe and alerts button so you can be notified of even more episodes of Pasture to Pen moving forward. Again, thank you all. Stay safe and pray for us.